Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Chris with three Ps and a Paul, and I'm here with my amazing co-hosts, Evan and Avery. Hello. Hey there. Hey. And today we have an awesome episode. We've been really excited to get to this one. We are titling, endearingly, Polyethics. Zero out of ten. Don't recommend. <laughs> That was yeah. my idea. Yes, very awesome title. And this one, we're going to delve into some of the unethical aspects of polyamory. Um, the people that give us a bad rap. Yes. The, the, the yes. bad vibes. No bueno. Yeah, the bad vibes crew. The bad vibes. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> so first off, I think we went to... Begin with the overarching concept here and talk about consent. Yeah. No matter what kind of a relationship you're in, whether you're in a monogamous relationship, a polyamorous relationship, or whatever, every single aspect of your relationship should be based on consent. And consent of all parties involved. And that includes metas. So we're not just talking about consent for sexual acts, too. We're talking about consent for relationship dynamics, for agreements that you're entering into, uh, basically every aspect of the relationship. And we're talking about informed consent as well. Yes, very important to highlight this because anything you do in a relationship at all or with any person consent is paramount and this is enthusiastic and continual consent and you do allow people to withdraw consent at any time that's right and let's just practice here for a second is consent so uh, let me take that back is yes consent enthusiastic yes 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 Yes. um maybe no no that's not consent I don't know. No. No. Absolutely not. No. There you go. Anything but an enthusiastic yes is not consent. Just put just put that out there. Any type of relationship, any part of a relationship, sex, emotional, whatever, anything that you engage in with another person where they are not fully, completely enthusiastically consenting to what's happening, you're You're falling into concepts of coercion and coercing people into Mm -hmm. situations that that they don't want to be in. And that's a really dangerous situation to put somebody in. It's not cool at all. So with that said, with consent being kind of the overarching theme to all of our topics here, the first thing we're going to talk about when it comes to polyamory ethics or being unethical is uh, rules and boundaries. Yes, boundaries good, rules bad. Or, yeah, I, I think the, the proper way to say it is rules versus boundaries. Boundaries are good because they set up like guardrails, right? Like safety guardrails within to, to keep yourself safe. Correct. They're basically um, you're giving your partner expectations for how you are going to behave. When you set a boundary with somebody, you say something like uh, an example would be when you talk to me that way, I'm going to leave the room. So you're telling your partner how you are going to respond to different styles of being treated. And when you're setting up a rule for somebody, what you're doing is you're saying you can't talk to me that way period when you're when you're setting a rule though you're basically telling your partner how they're going to act and Mm. you can't do that because you don't own your partner you can't tell them what to do your partner is able to do whatever they want to do and you just have to tell them how you're going to respond to their behavior right and you're also not your partner's parent either so can't do that. So a rule is is setting expectations for somebody else's behavior and a boundary is setting expectations for your own. Exactly. 
So kind of the idea behind setting boundaries and consent and that kind of thing is when we practice ethical polyamory, we're kind of moving away from the permission model of relationships in which um, it's this idea that within a partnership, you are allowing somebody to to do something or like the idea that I'm allowing Evan to date other people even though that's like literally not how it works we have uh, consented to a polyamorous relationship an open polyamorous relationship and we have set boundaries for how we create new relationships but I'm not allowing anybody to do anything they're making choices for their own behavior and, and actions and permission models go beyond just relationship structures like if i want to go out with my friends on wednesday night i'm not going to ask avery permission but i'm going to go to them and, and say hey i'm thinking about going out on wednesday night is there anything you need for me to make that comfortable for you Exactly. So Evan comes to me and says, I want to go out with my friends on Wednesday night. What do you need from me? And maybe I say, you know, Wednesday night's not a very good night for us because we have X, Y, and Z going on. Would you be able to go out with your friends on Thursday night instead? And that would be me asking him rather than telling him no you can't go out with your friends Wednesday because I need you at home so the permission model of relationships is where Evan would come to me and say in this particular example Evan would come to come to me and say hey babe is it all right if I go out with my friends on Wednesday night this is something that I want to do what do you need from me to make this happen Yeah, and basically what you're doing is, you know, when you're stepping outside of the permission model, um, you are, you are taking power over your autonomy. And if you are living in a permission model, you're giving all of your power to your partner. And that kind of power dynamic is not something that you want to live inside. It's not sustainable and it can breed resentment too. It can absolutely breed resentment. The hell was that? What the fuck was that? Sorry, I burped. <laughs> <laughs> this is a message for future Chris editing this. I just want you to know that I love you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love you too. All right. So where were we? Um, yeah, what's next? So I think on the same token of talking about, you know, permission models and having to ask permissions is partners that have the ability to say no or take it even a step further and say no to relationships or dates or partners in that way. And that's in the form of vetoes. Yeah. So they're not saying no to their own partners, their own dates, their own relationships. They're looking at their partner's relationships and saying, nope, don't like that. You got to break it off. And that is called having a veto in place in your relationships. And if you can't tell by our tone, uh, we think vetoes are unethical. Well, I mean, that's kind of the premise of the episode. (laughs) It's all unethical. Do you have a 10 do not recommend? Exactly. When you have a veto situation with your partner, um, it just it's just an opportunity to be dishonest. And it's gonna it breeds resentment. Mm-hmm. And it just, you know, it, it reeks of partner privilege, which is another term that we talked about on our last episode, which I think goes along with vetoes. Um, you know, when you're in a hierarchical situation and the primary relationship has partner privilege, um, it, it's just a violation of consent because, you know, using a veto... Uh, your partner didn't consent to that and your partner's partner didn't consent to that. And anytime you exercise a privilege, you're violating consent down the line somewhere. Right. And 
if you're the one issuing the veto, it injects yourself into something that you have nothing to do with. Mm hmm. And a lot of people who have veto agreements built into their poly relationships, particularly people who practice hierarchical poly, um, say things like if their partner doesn't like the veto that they used, which like who would like when their partner used a veto, they say, yeah, but you agreed to this when we made our relationship agreement. And like, well, that's technically true. You're using coercive tactics to get mm-hmm. somebody to agree to something you want. Besides the fact that the meta that you just ended their relationship, if say you're using your veto power to end a relationship, the meta, the secondary partner that you just told couldn't be with your partner anymore, they did not, they were not a part of your relationship agreement. So something we really advocate against is you can't set rules in a relationship agreement where it applies to people who aren't present in that moment. Right. Right. And, and you, and you had made mention to, um, to, to, it gives us a good flow into the next topic was talking about, you know, hierarchical poly and vetoes are usually a huge piece of being in a hierarchical type relationship because it, it, that's how you have your privilege, so to speak, which is, is not good at all, obviously, but is vetoes being one piece of hierarchical poly, what are other unethical ways that hierarchical poly is unethical? Um, just anytime you exercise partner privilege, it's unethical because you're treating the secondary partner as if they're not as important and it never, it does not feel good being a secondary partner. Right. And I've, I've known people in, in hierarchical relationships where they were playing secondary partners and they were constantly living in fear that their meta was going to veto them. And so they were never able to form a secure attachment with their partner. They were never able to feel safe in that relationship. Always walking on eggshells. Exactly. And not only working on, you know, the relationship that they had with their partner, but they were constantly worried about pleasing their meta. Mm. It, 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 it's taking away the attention from actually fostering that relationship. You, you just, you just can't form you can't. a secure attachment under those circumstances. It's impossible. Not at all. Not at all. Especially when you just, you just feel like you have no power over your destiny. You just feel helpless. Mm-hmm. All of the power is in somebody else's hands. And anytime you have an unbalanced power dynamic like that, it's not ethical. With that said, are you down with OPP? Oh my goodness. One penis policies. That's another, that's another thing that you typically find in hierarchical relationships that do vetoes and things like that is, is, is a one penis policy. And basically what that is, is it's typically a cis man that sets this rule that says like to his, to his usually female partner, you can be with other women, but you can't be with other men. And that's from insecurity, friends. Because that man does not want to be compared to another penis haver. Insecurity. Mm-hmm. And it's it's usually because of insecurity. That's exactly right. And I'll admit it. At first, I had those thoughts. But I got over myself real quick. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. You I've had wanted, those thoughts, yeah. You wanted a one penis policy originally? Like OG, original, yeah. I had really low self-esteem, and I didn't think highly of myself, and I didn't think I was worth much. And it was one of those, oh, well, if you get something better, what am I worth type deals. But you know what helped that? Therapy. You know, it's a good rule of thumb that if you're making your partner responsible for your own feelings then it's probably unethical very much so and and now today obviously i think 
one penis policy is completely disgusting, obviously. But patriarchy. Um, ugh, fuck that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but definitely. Um, I'm just going to throw this out there, uh, folks with penises. If you feel that you have to have a one penis policy, talk to a therapist, look inward. Uh, if it is a condition of you doing polyamory, then there is a serious problem there and you shouldn't be doing polyamory. Right. You, you need to work on yourself first, for sure. And I'd also ask you the question of... Like, is this about bio dick or is it about any kind of dick? Um, and if you were, if you're only saying it about, about bio dick, then that's probably also a problem too. That's, that's what it was for me. It's a little bit transphobic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I admit I had a lot of problematic thoughts and feelings when I first entered this foray. Took a lot of growth on my part. Well, you've come a long way. Yeah. I, I'm proud of that work, and that's why I'm not afraid to admit that I used to think that way because I know how much work I put into it. And like as I said, I'm not trying to hear be like, "Oh, look what I did," but it also goes back to it takes work on yourself, and you can't be afraid to do that work. Mm-hmm. Also, one more thing about one penis policy. Yes, they are misogynistic mm. because basically, what you're saying to female-bodied people is the sex that you are having is not real sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's a lot of times what it boils down to is I don't want you having sex with other men because I don't want you comparing me to them. But it doesn't count if you're having sex with other women because that's not real sex, which like. So on the so, so that kind of gives us the overview of, of, of what a one penis policy is obviously not good, obviously misogynistic, obviously toxic unethical kind of on a a flip side of of that kind of related usually but um not the same thing but it has similar you know undertones to it as unicorn hunting usually when you see unicorn hunting it's usually a a couple that's like cisgender couple typically a man and a woman looking for another woman usually So, unicorn hunting is a huge controversy in the polyamory world. Right. Some people will swear up and down that unicorn hunting is ethical. Um, And I would, what I would say to those people is um, if you were talking about an existing couple that is looking for a third. Um, if you, if a condition of dating a new person is that you have to be dating both people, both parties in that is established relationship, that's unethical. that's unethical. If you're dating separately and your partner finds somebody who they're dri- driving with and you meet that person and organically you form your own relationship, which is essentially what happened here in our triad. Mm-hmm. Um, then that is an ethical way to form a triad. But if you're telling somebody you can't date my partner unless you date both of us, that's unethical. Because again, you've set a rule in your relationship agreement that applies to somebody that doesn't even exist in your life yet. And that person, again, did not ding, 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 consent. consent. Right. And typically with unicorn hunting, the the bad ethics don't stop there. Typically, there's still a primary partner. Typically, there's still partner privilege. And typically, there's still a one penis policy. Like all of those things typically go together. Right. Now, being devil's advocate here, what about folks that want to be unicorns? Uh, What I would say to that is uh, those people are typically swingers from my experience. Those people are typically swingers and they go to swingers clubs and they um, are unicorns for a night and then they go home after that. There is not a person
person out there who wants to be a secondary partner, who wants to be um, treated as uh, unequal. Right. Long term in a romantic relationship. That's what I would say to that. So you have the unicorn hunters out there. That's usually the couples that are looking for a third. On the flip side of that, you have what they call cowgirls and cowboys. Mm-hmm. And what they want to do is come in and pull someone out of the poly lifestyle. Is that how I understood that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they're they typically monogamous people who come into a poly situation and they're trying to rope people out of, out of the poly lifestyle. And it's along the same lines of like, you just haven't found the right person yet type thing. Um, so it's men or women who come along trying to pull you out of the, the poly lifestyle. Yeah, and that's not cool because that gives similar vibes to like, like the people that are like, if I'm with them, they won't be gay anymore. Yeah, and that's very disgusting. Like, oh, you just haven't found the right man yet. Yeah, it, like Ugh. the the concept of like cowgirls, cowboys it, is um, the same. You just haven't found the right person that you want to settle down with. Yeah, and it's coercive because typically what these people do is they say, "Oh, I'll date you, and it's okay that you're poly." That's fine. You can continue to be poly. And then once the relationship is established and you have invested in that relationship, down the line, they'll come back and say, actually, I only want to be in a monogamous relationship. So if you want to be with me, you have to be monogamous now. And that's really, really painful for a lot of poly people because you're kind of faced with this choice of, do I end this relationship that I've invested a lot of time and energy and care into? It could be someone you've fallen for. Yeah, it could be someone you're in love with. Or do I, you know, behave in a way that is against my core values? And do I live monogamously? Um, you know, some people might choose to, to live monogamously and, and some people might choose to end that relationship. But for a lot of poly people, that's a core value to who we are. And to be faced with that choice is deeply uncomfortable. Right. And it, and it all wraps up to the main premise of this is th- they did not consent to be in a relationship to change like that. Exactly. You've, you've set somebody up for failure. You've drawn somebody into a relationship under false pretenses. Exactly. And that's not not cool at all. At all. And that's really devastating for some polyamorous people because typically polyamory is not just a lifestyle, but it's an entire philosophy about relationships. And so, um, you know, when you're when you're faced with that decision about do I give up my entire philosophy, you know, that's that's a lot to ask of a person. Mm, It is. But when you're talking about like relationship philosophies and things like that, one form of polyamory um, that doesn't necessarily follow that philosophy is called don't ask, don't tell. And so essentially in a don't ask, don't tell situation, um, your partner is allowed, and I say that with air quotes, to, to do whatever they want, but you don't want to know about it. You don't want to hear about it. You don't want to know where they're going. You don't want to know who they're with. You don't want to know what they're doing. And so that is a little bit outside of a typical polyamory philosophy because you're not really um, you're not really sharing your experiences with your partner. You're not able to share your joys. You're not you're not even able to really be uh, sexually safe with your partner because your partner has no idea what they're consenting to. Well, and if you think about it on the flip side of that, the the other partner, they're trying to live in a fantasy world of nothing's happening, but they know it's happening. So it's like, a, it's like, why would you even want to be in that kind of middle ground of unknown? Well, and the problem with that is, is that the partner that has no idea what's happening, they just have no idea what they're consenting to. Mm. And so you can't ever have real consent from your partner under those situations because they have no idea what's going on. It leaves no space for accountability either. Mm. Like, are you doing safe things? Are you doing what you said you would do or 
or would not do, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You have no idea how to set boundaries with that person because you don't know what you need boundaries around. Because you could say things like you... Um, like if, if we're going to practice polyamory, then like you have to practice safe sex out outside of this relationship. Like you shouldn't be fluid bonding with other people. You should be using condoms. Um, but I don't want to hear or know or see anything having to do with your other relationships. That partner can go out and, and do essentially whatever the fuck they want because you've ask them to set that boundary but you're not leaving any space for yourself to hold them accountable to that and you can't have those discussions exactly. right they they could say all right yeah cool and then they don't follow through with it mm-hmm. and you'll never know exactly so uh i just mentioned something called fluid bonding and what i mean by fluid bonding is essentially um unprotected sex it's exchange of fluids between two partners And there are typically relationship agreements in place in polyamorous families um, about fluid bonding and about when it's appropriate. And does, you know, does everybody consent to this? But in a don't ask, don't tell situation, you know, like I said, you have no idea what your other partner is doing. So there's no way that you can consent to them fluid bonding with somebody else. So essentially, um, if you if you take all of the topics that we've talked about here tonight and we've talked about all of these unethical things that exist in polyamory, you know, what is ethical then? Uh, Something I think that we would all agree with is open communication, Mm -hmm. honesty and getting consent from your partners. Consent, consent, consent. Respecting your own autonomy, not yep. entering into unbalanced power dynamics, setting your own boundaries, exerting your own autonomy and holding your partners accountable. I think there's a huge philosophy change for those of you out there who might be monogamous and interesting and in starting into polyamory. You're changing your I would say radically changing your concept of relationships and self because what you're doing is in, instead of thinking of having like this ownership or this philosophy that you have a say in what uh, your partner does you you're turning that into yourself and you can put more control into yourself than you are another person yeah you are you're placing a lot of power in your own autonomy Mm-hmm. And you are making yourself responsible for your own feelings yep. and not making it your partner's problem. Exactly. So when Avery is dating somebody new and I'm starting to feel a little bit jealous, I am not going to veto that person. I'm not going to put restrictions on Avery. I'm not going to ask Avery to cancel their dates. It's not their responsibility. It's not their responsibility. If I'm feeling jealous and if I need support, the, the ethical thing to do is to talk to Avery and say, hey, I'm feeling this way. Can you offer me some reassurance about my place in your life? Yeah. Own it. Own those feelings. If you're feeling that jealousy, dig down and, and find out what's causing that on your own. And to be honest, a lot of these, um, a lot of these unethical structures that we've talked about here today, um, a lot of people utilize them for the simple act of avoiding jealousy Mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a hard feeling to deal with sometimes and everybody is capable of feeling jealousy at some point in their life. You need to take jealousy and instead of looking at it as a, a bad thing, look at it as a learning opportunity for yourself. If you are feeling jealous, It's not for no reason. Right. It's because you have a need that is being unmet. And so when you're feeling jealous, the ethical thing to do is to take an inventory of your life and your relationships and see what it is, what need of yours is being unmet. Right. And every time you have that urge to want to go back into a codependent or an unethical practice because of you, you want to run the opposite direction of jealousy, run towards it and dig down and figure out what is causing it. That is your ultimate resolution to 
resolving those feelings, not just putting a Band-Aid over it or not avoiding it. Figure out what it is. Discover yourself and what that actually looks like and what's causing it. So I think that's a good place to sort of wrap up for this episode. Um, deal with your own feelings, guys. Really? Just just own them. And don't make them others' responsibilities. And you will feel so much better about yourself when you do. Don't, Absolutely. Don't force yourself into feeling shame for having, for having negative emotions. Because, you know, everybody does. Everybody does. Embrace them. And then... Do some self-discovery. And, And like, figure your own shit out, guys. Right. But you'll be a a lot happier and a lot better off for doing that. So, with that said, I think we'll wrap this episode up of uh, Polyamory Ethics. Zero out of ten. Don't recommend. And uh, we will call it a show. Uh, We'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, You could find us online on all the social apps, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, please, if you have not yet subscribed, please subscribe. You can find us at listen.3psinapoly.com. There you will find links that will show you where you can subscribe to us on Spotify, on Amazon, on Apple Podcasts, literally any of the platforms we are on there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. I know Evan and Avery have both mentioned in other episodes. Reach out to them on messenger we're on facebook hit me up yeah and uh we will definitely answer any questions you may have we love questions we love interacting with you guys and uh giving you guys the content that you want and if you'd like to hear about any topics or anything on future episodes definitely reach out to us there as well and let us know what you'd like to hear we're always open for new suggestions on uh, content so with that said any final parting words evan have a great day folks avery be slutty. Yep, be sluts. Get we f- believe in you. <laughs> Get fucked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have a good one, guys. Take care. This is Chris, Evan, and Avery with three P's and a Polly. Bye. Bye.